So good to see smiling faces this morning. God has been good to us. It's a blessing to be here. We welcome all of our visitors who've come. We hope that you have your Bibles with you. We'll be in a very familiar, often almost weekly used passage, Leviticus chapter 1. Okay, so Leviticus doesn't get a lot of attention, of course, although I hope that by the time you're done today, not only this morning, but also tonight, of all of the Old Testament passages and letters, perhaps you'll consider Leviticus to be the clearest mosaic picture of the power of Jesus Christ in your life of anything found in the entirety of the Old Testament. I'll make that argument to the best of my ability in a moment. Hope you're in Leviticus 1 as we get started today. It is really good to be home. Seven nights in Arizona. Always good to be back in your own bed. There's really no place like home. Enjoyed the week. I was able to spend the first half of that week in Phoenix at the Monte Vista Church, uh, which is doing well. They're facing all of the same challenges we are, going through all of the same struggles. But I had an opportunity to have dinner with the, the elders and their wives and the preacher and his wife and just talk to them about it. And there's so much camaraderie because of that. Because we're one church and we all want to see one another do well, learned a lot of things. Midweek, uh, midway through the week, Summer joined me. She was able to worship with us on Wednesday night. And then we traveled north to Sedona for a few days. I think maybe our favorite place on the planet, I think. So we enjoyed that and we're glad to be home last night to see our, uh, our dog. No. <laughs> to see our kids and to see you and to be back in the swing of things. A couple of things to note as we get started. Uh, one other thing I want to say, it's very important to say, we were able to check out some of the live stream while we were gone. Don't you feel incredibly blessed by the men that we have who can preach and teach at this congregation? Uh, Tim's lessons, Jonathan's lessons, Ben's class, just rich and well done. And we certainly have uh, almost an embarrassment of riches of teachers. But what it means is God's invested a great deal in this work and he expects a great deal of fruit to bear. And I think that we're in a position to do that. So I wanted to thank Jonathan and the other two men were in the, the morning service. Okay, a couple of things about what we've done in the beginning of this year, going back a few weeks. We started talking about just finding Jesus in Scripture. And I made a very simple argument, thesis statement, that the entire Bible, beginning to end, is all about Jesus Christ. All 66 letters from Genesis to Revelation are painting a picture of our Messiah and his importance in your life. You have 40 different writers. You have 1,600 years, three continents, three languages, just one story. And so we started looking at that together. And what I was hoping would happen is that you would start an Old Testament read this year. I mean, it's Genesis. We pick up the five-day reading program. would put you in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And you would start to notice him in your reading. Now, just to recap a little bit of that, we're looking for Jesus in the Old Testament in three special ways. Number one is when the text just literally shows you that Christ is there. Some examples of this that we found in Genesis is where it said, let us make man in our image. Jesus is a part of the us. Jesus was there during the creation of the world. And so we look for the presence of Jesus. We're also looking for what we call messianic promises. These are Old Testament prophecies that were pointing directly to the fulfillment of Christ. And the Old Testament has at least 100 of those that can be noted in your Bible read this year. And then thirdly, I think our favorite one to study are the precursors, the shadows, where we study people or events. And it's not really about those people or their events. It's about the groundwork that they laid upon which Christ built his life. So if you'll take these three words into your Bible read, I think you'll notice some things. So we started a few weeks ago with two lessons on the book of Genesis, and we saw all three of these things. We saw the presence of Jesus, as I mentioned, where it said, let us make man in our image or let us go down and confuse their language. Jesus was a part of the creation of mankind. We saw at least three promises in Genesis, prophecies about Jesus. If this was a Bible class, I'd see if you could name those three. Can you come up with three Genesis passages that are prophecies about Christ? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of a woman would crush Satan on the head. Genesis chapter 12, the three promises to Abraham. The third one is in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Genesis 49, maybe my favorite because we don't talk about it a lot. And Genesis 49, where Jacob was promised to, Ju uh, to Judah that Judah's children would rule 
and that one of them would call the obedience of all the nations to him. And so that was about Jesus from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of the book. And then, of course, the precursors. We studied this in multiple forms. We looked in Genesis 22 about Abraham offering Isaac. That's a picture. That's a picture of God the Father offering his son, except there was no replacement for the son. The son had to die. And then I think you'll remember, and I had a chance to preach this in Phoenix as well, the story of Joseph. A story that doesn't even look like it had to happen. Happened because there were 16 things in that event that connected to the events of Jesus' life. So we saw that in Genesis and we moved to Exodus. We saw more of it. In Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, there's not so much of those, those messianic promises, but we had the presence of Jesus. We learned from the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10 that when, when Israel came through the Red Sea and they stood on the rock on the other side, the rock was Christ. Jesus was actually there supporting Israel at the time of their deliverance. Jude verse 4 mentions that the Lord Jesus delivered them from Egypt. He was actually there. Now, what's really great in Exodus are all the precursors, the shadows. Could you name three of those, by the way? I feel like we should dismiss and turn this into a Bible class right now. Can you list three shadows that are fulfilled in Jesus in the book of Exodus? Well, Stephen gives you one of them. He says the birth of Moses, a special birth that led to a great deliverer. Moses was a picture of Jesus and his special virgin birth and the great deliverance. We certainly have the Passover lamb. That would be the easiest one, I think. The blood over the doorposts so that death would pass a house. When you have the blood of Jesus over your home, death passes over you. And then we studied last time in 1 Corinthians 10, the actual Exodus event. They were baptized through the water into Moses and you are baptized through the water into Christ. All of that is the book of Exodus. And so it brings us to the oh so popular book of Leviticus. Leviticus is known as the letter where Bible reading programs go to die. You start off reading Genesis in January and you enjoy it and you do very well. And you get into Exodus in February and you're enjoying that. And then you start to start to get to that last half of the book of Exodus, chapters 25 through 40. You guys remember chapter 25 through 40 in Exodus where you have the tabernacle. And you have the structure of the tabernacle and the size and all the overlays and the gold and the wood and the priests and their garments. But you made it. You made it to Leviticus only to be rewarded with 12 chapters of bloodshed, of sin offerings and peace offerings and details about the high priest. And you made it through that. But this is where it gets hard. Leviticus 11 through 27. Anybody know what Leviticus 11 through 27 is about? Laws. Every conceivable, boringly worded law, laws about morality, which are not boringly worded, but also about like property lines. Like if you put build something on your neighbor's lawn, what you have to do about it. in Garden Valley where we live. We know a lot about that, Jonathan. A lot of fences get built in the wrong place. But Leviticus is all about these great, distinct laws. And it's really hard to read. But again, I want to restate what I opened with. There is not a letter in the Old Testament pointing you more to Jesus Christ than this one. It'll come in two forms today. I hope you stick with us all day long. In the morning lesson, which we're in right now, I want you to focus in on Leviticus chapter one and the sin offering. I want you to see the bloodshed, understand why the blood was shed, and certainly see how Jesus brought all of that together. And then if the Lord is willing tonight, we'll look at Jesus as high priest. And I think you're going to find that really fascinating, not just because it shows us the distinction of the high priesthood of Jesus, but also because we are what? What are we? We're priests under the old law. You had all these just regular old Israelites who just showed up to church when they had sinned. But you had these priests who served under the family of the high priest, appointed priests. Well, that's what we are. We're not just regular old citizens that show up when we did something wrong. We're actually appointed priests under the high priest. And that's pretty special stuff. So you'll see some application of that as we get a little further along. But for today's study, your focus is on these blood, animal, sin offerings found in the first 10 chapters. Leviticus chapter one, please. I'll make a note on this, the best sermon I've ever heard. I think I've heard it four times. 
The best sermon I've ever heard on the blood sacrifices and their comparison to Jesus is from Russ Bowman. Russ has an amazing sermon on this. Tomorrow when I send out the email, I'll go find one of the videos around the country where he taught on this section and I'll tag that. I encourage you to listen to that. I listen to it in preparation for this because it starts with, Russ starts with asking this question. You know, we understand that they had to offer a sin offering, that when they sinned, they had to shed blood. Blood was necessary. A payment was necessary in order to bring them back from their sins. Because you already know in Romans 3 that the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. Hey, welcome. Glad you're here. Death. The question is, why? Why is the wages of sin death? Why couldn't the wages, the payout of sin been like mild chastisement? Why did it have to be that when we sin, we die unless somehow we can be brought back? And Russ answers this so well, and I want to mimic some of what he said. He said that in John 1, and we studied this a few weeks ago, that in God is life, that God is the creator of life. That all that is alive is alive because of God and separated from God. There can be no life. If I'm not with God, I'm dead or dying. And so God is not only life, but he's holiness. There's no sin in God. Sin is, Isaiah 59, separated from God. So, so get this. When you and I sin, Isaiah 59, what happens? Our sin has separated us from God. So let me ask you, if God is the only source of life, and your sin has separated you from God, what is your only outcome? Death. You have to die. Everything not associated with God is death. And so when we're in sin, we can live out this carnal life. You can live to be 100 maybe, but you're going to die. And your soul is going to die unless we are brought back. So in, in Leviticus 1, God introduced this idea. He said, every time you sin, you, you, you can lose me, but I will accept blood as a way, not your own blood, but the blood of another as a way to be atoned. Chapter one, verse four. There are so many examples of this. He shall lay, this is a burnt offering. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. God said, check this out. You can bring an animal. You can lay that animal down. You can slit that animal's throat. It can bleed all over you and everyone else and everything. And you can feel the life draining out of this animal until it is dead. I will allow that blood atonement to bring atonement into place to cover your sin. Look in chapter four, please. In chapter four and in verse four, this is the sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord and he shall lay his hand on the head of the bull and he shall slay the bull before God. Now here's what happens. Go to verse 20. He shall also do with the bull, just as he did with the bull of the sin offering. Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atonement for them and they will be forgiven. Now, here's what's really interesting about this. You already know that the book of Hebrews teaches that no amount of blood of bulls or goats could achieve forgiveness of sins. Are you aware of that from Hebrews chapter 10? And yet it says right here that when you lay that bull down, which a bull a year old could be a thousand pounds. Okay, it's not just like some tiny little creature. You have like a thousand pound bull. You march to the temple. You somehow are able to lay it down. You put the weight of your hands on it and you bleed it while it fights for life. And yet as a result of that, it says there is atonement and there is forgiveness. If you're looking for Jesus, you just found him. Because we know that the blood of bulls and goats could not give forgiveness of sins. Now, let me suggest something to you for study you might find interesting. The word atonement occurs over 100 times in the Old Testament. Offer this creature for atonement. Offer this creature for atonement. Do you know what the word atonement means? It means to cover something. Stick with me on this. To cover something. In fact, literally, it means to like cover with pitch. So I want you to imagine this. What he's saying is when you offer this blood that I require, all it does for you is it puts pitch over the cracks. That which you are broken, it doesn't fix what's broken. It only puts cover over it. Think about, uh, we, we mentioned the ark in the prayer. Think about how you had the pieces of wood and you lay the pitch over it. Are there still creases in the wood even after you pitch it? 
The wood is still not connected, but you cover that for the time being. Or like Moses in the wicker basket, they covered the wicker basket with pitch so that it could float. But is the wicker basket still wickery? Like it's still porous. It's just covered for the time being. Listen carefully. When they offered the blood of bulls and goats and doves and every other thing, it allowed for God to cover the sin, but the cracks were still there. They were not repaired. They were not whole again. They were simply atoned for. And yet in verse 20, it says, as a result of the sin offering, there will be forgiveness of sins. Do you know why it said that? Hold your finger here in Leviticus and go with me to Hebrews, please. Chapter nine, Hebrews chapter nine. If you're headed over to Hebrews, you could look in chapter 10, verse 11 for a second. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11, you can see that the priest daily ministered, but the sacrifices could not take away sins. They could lay cover, but they couldn't remove. But go to chapter 9, verse 15. Here is where Jesus enters into the Levitical picture. It says in Hebrews 9 and 14, how much more will the blood of Christ cleanse us through the eternal spirit? For this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place, watch this, for the redemption, not the atonement, not the cover, the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Here's what we're learning. The blood of bulls and goats put a bandaid over it, but it didn't heal it. The blood of Jesus reconciled it and brought it back together. Let me ask a trivia question. The word atonement appears 103 times in the Old Testament. And you can use two hands. In fact, I'll give you a hint. You only need one hand for this. How many times do you think the word atonement appears in the New Testament? How many times? Anybody? Zero. The word atonement is foreign to a relationship with Jesus. Because when you are washed in the blood of the sin offering of the Christ, they don't throw a cover over your sins and hide it. It is removed. You're not still cracked, but concealed. You're actually repaired. I should say this. The King James Version uses the word atonement in Romans 5 just to throw a kink in this sermon. And honestly, it's just a bunch of Englishmen just being a little naughty. But that word is used four times and the King James goes reconciled, reconciled, reconciled every time. It throws in atonement once. It's a, mis, it's a mistranslation. The truth is this. The text is teaching us back in Leviticus that the blood was associated with the restored life. Only through the mess that was made could you ever be reconciled, but not even reconciled unless it be through Jesus. So let's go back and take a closer look at this. Go back with me now to Leviticus chapter four. I want you to notice some things. How often... Do you think the Israelites were reminded that when you sin, it separates you from life and blood is required to make it right again? How often do you think that happened? Do you think that uh, once every couple of months, you know, Ron and I may make a trip down there and take a bull and wrestle it? You think that's how that worked? It was every day. First of all, we learn about that bull in verses three and four, Leviticus chapter four, verses three and four, how they would bring that thousand pound bull and they would feel the life escape it. But look in verse two, that was if you committed unintentional sins. How often were you offering bulls? I would need to have a bull farm just for the purpose of sacrificing the blood of bulls. Because every time I committed a sin, even if I didn't mean to, you ever commit sins and you didn't mean to, but you did? Bull. A bull will die. A ram. You don't have one? Go get some doves. We'll sacrifice. Blood will be shed. Look, you talk about being a good person and like living a righteous life and somehow God's going to take me to heaven because I live a righteous life. I'm not even a good enough person to outweigh my unintentional sins. The sin of omission, which is a very dangerous and scary statement. Much less intentional sins. He said you would offer a bull as a sin offering even if you didn't mean to sin. In chapter 5, when there was any form of impurity, anything unholy, remember, remember, God is holy. So if I'm unholy, I've lost my life and I need blood to be shed to get my life back again. In chapter five, verse two, if you touch something that's unclean, touch some human uncleanliness in verse three, even if you swear 
thoughtlessly with your lips, verse 4. So if you touch something that made you unclean, if you said something that was unclean, go get a bull because it's time to get blood everywhere again. And how much blood's in a bull anyway? A thimble? A cup? They would be going over and over and over again. There'd be blood running down the streets. There'd be blood all over the priests, all over the temple, all over the courtyard, and all over you. You'd have blood all over you because something innocent died. And its blood touched everyone. And I mean, they put it on like your right earlobe, your right big toe. They put blood everywhere so that you could see this innocent thing has covered all of us in blood so that I can have some level of hope. Folks, if that doesn't make you think about Jesus... And the power of his blood, honestly, for me, it makes me think about God, how he loved us enough that he put his hand on the sacrifice. The innocent one who didn't need the lamb to die for himself actually allowed his own son to be executed to save the lives of the people around them. And how often did this happen? Let's see. They offered an animal sacrifice at the temple to start each day and to end each day. That's two. It's a lot of blood. Every time priests changed shifts, they offered an animal for their cleanliness. Every new moon, you had one. For all the big three feasts throughout the year, you had blood sacrifices. All year long, you had cyclical sacrifice. And that doesn't even count all of the unintentional and intentional sinners of the millions of Jews who flooded into that place every day. You know, we probably have a model in one of the classrooms of the temple. Do, do we have that? You know, we have like the temple and the little courtyard and the laver there and the, the altar and all that. You know, if we really want to show kids what that looked like, we should go buy like an industrial five pounds of ketchup and just slosh it across the whole thing and then just like dump it on them. Let's just put ketchup on the walls and on the temple and on the people because that's what that was like. Oh, by the way, plus flies and smell and entrails. And they're wearing white or used to be white garments. Tim and I were talking afterwards. He's like, what'd they clean that stuff with? I don't know. But it wouldn't have lasted long anyway. Do you understand how an Israelite was not allowed to go like a single day without connecting blood innocently poured so that I can even have a chance with God? I don't fault at all the fact that we meet here on Sunday mornings and we take 10 minutes and we partake of the Lord's Supper and we remember his blood and we, we drink that. We do that, it's lawful and it's right. But unless the blood of Jesus is having an impact on our lives all day, every day, every time we sin, every time we feel helpless, we remember that the blood was poured for us, it needs to be a whole lot more than just a Lord's Supper observation in the morning of Sunday. Go to Leviticus chapter 16. All of that that we've discussed doesn't even include the big event, the one that the New Testament talks a lot about, the great day of atonement, the one day a year, you know this well, where only the high priest would go into the holy of holies place and take two animals. They would take a goat and they would take a bull and Aaron would go in and he would offer both of them. And Leviticus talks a lot about that. Look in chapter 16, verse 2. Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So all year long, he was not allowed in there, only once per year. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linens and so forth. In verse six, he shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for him, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. Now, if you go to verse 34, you learn that they did this every single year. And it was this moment when Israel, I want to say they were freed from their sin, but listen to what I said earlier. Really, there was just a big blanket, a pitch blanket thrown over the sin, except that God knew that Jesus would come, Hebrews 9, and that his sacrifice would not be an atonement bloodshed. It would be a reconciliation bloodshed. And so powerful would the blood of Jesus be that it would reconcile every single Christian who goes in his name to the Father and every single Israelite for the entirety of that nation's life on this earth. Let's go take a look at some of this in Hebrews, please. If you ever want to study the blood sacrifice of Jesus, if you're interested in digging in a little deeper on all these Levitical offerings and the blood and its connection to Christ, look no further than Hebrews 9 and 10. 
Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 connect these things for us in an unmistakable way. Let's start in chapter 10. In chapter 10, we see in verse 4 again, that no matter how many millions of gallons were shed and poured through the streets, it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now pick up with me in verse 10. By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now I've got to pause here. It did not say atoned. It said sanctified. That's not the same thing. Atoned is throw some tar over it. We'll be fine. Sanctified is fix it. You're fixed. Your cracks are repaired. Your brokenness is brought back together. Only Christ's death could do that for us. Verse 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, verse 12, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are, and you see it here again, sanctified. So how much should the blood of Jesus be impactful in our lives? And that it did what none of those offerings over 1,500 years could do. Now go back to chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 directly connects the once a year day of atonement where the high priest takes the two animals into the Holy of Holies and it connects that to Jesus as both our high priest, more on that tonight, and the sacrifice. He serves both roles. Pick up with me here in verse 6. Now, when these things have been so prepared, it's talking about the temple and all those pieces, tabernacle. When these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Now, that's how it worked. Now, go to verse 11. But when Christ appeared, everything changed. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not some tent, not some temple in Jerusalem. He entered the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. He entered into heaven and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place, heaven, once for all, having obtained eternal what? Redemption, bought back. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus is greater He's greater than the Levitical priesthood and the Levitical offerings, but they were all there to paint a very flat, two very bloody, flat, two-dimensional picture of our Messiah. He is the three-dimensional fulfillment of it all. He overshadows it all, and he accomplished what none of it could. Now then, as I said, we need to try to remember that. And it needs to have an effect on us. And it starts on the first day of the week with a small amount of grape juice that we drink. But I want to show you really quickly here three things to think about as you leave today. Where this should have more relevance than just leaving here going, Lord's Supper's good and maybe Leviticus isn't as bad as I thought. We can do better. And I'll show you what those three things are. Go with me to John 3. Three things about the blood of Jesus. Number one, there is a drawing power in the blood of Jesus. If I understand that sin means death and I am a sinner, which means I must die. And I understand that my own blood, nor all the blood of everything that exists on this earth, none of it could ever make me right with God. Only the blood of Jesus. I am going to the cross. I'm drawn to it. It is my only hope, my only chance and when we get to John 3, that language is used for us. Look in John chapter 3 and verse 13. We all know John 3, 16, back up a little bit. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses, and this is a little book of numbers here, we may get a sermon on that in a few weeks. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up 
so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know, to be lifted up on a cross that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do you remember that story from the book of Numbers? They had been bitten by serpents. They were going to what? And die. They were poisoned and they were going to die. They said, hey, we want to go back to Egypt. We just want to go live the lives. God said, well, let me put you back in the state you were in when I found you. And he had them bitten by snakes. You're going to die. That's how I found you. And now you're back. The only way we can get that life returned to you is if you go this way and you look at that bronze serpent that's been lifted up for you. In John chapter 12, please, we know that Jesus is that bronze serpent. In John chapter 12 and verse 31, now judgment, John 12, 31, is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And Jesus says, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. What do you mean? He was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he would die. Cross, blood, poured out sacrifice. Well, one thing of three that Jesus' sacrifice should do is it should draw you to him. He is our only hope, but there's more. His blood is not just about one way to heaven, the only way to heaven and drawing to it. There is a sense in which we should be convicted by it. Do you know why Jesus had to die? Because of the sins of people. Because people were told the right thing to do and they chose not to do it. In fact, what was the first promise in the Bible that Jesus would shed his blood? Genesis 3 and verse 15. Do you know why it's there? Because Adam and Eve sinned. They sinned and they separated themselves from God. And he said, I will send my son and he will come to convict the world in this sense. The cross will never let us forget what has to happen when we sin? You think the Israelites were ever able to forget? Anybody think the Israelites were ever able to forget what it cost to sin? There were lines of people offering bulls every single day. They were covered in blood. Wouldn't even come out of their clothes, I would imagine. We've got to have that kind of a remembrance when we think about Jesus. The death of Jesus has this convicting power that says, my sin placed you here. You have drawn me to you. And if I'm drawing to you, I'm pulling away from sin. Remember that? The wages of sin is death because God is life and he's holy and sin is separated. I'm convicted to live free of sin. Romans helps us with this. Go to Romans chapter five, please. Romans chapter five and verse eight and following. God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So what does that mean? Chapter six, verse one, does that mean we can sin now? Does that mean that now that I've, I've come to the cross and I beg for mercy and I can see the bloodshed, that I can go out and live however I want? They wondered about that in chapter six, verse one. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Do we see this in the religious world? I think that we do. I think we see people who sing there's power in the blood like we're going to sing in a few minutes and they remember Jesus and they wear t-shirts about Jesus and they talk about the bloodshed of Jesus and then they go out and they live however they want. They don't know Jesus at all. The cross is a convicting power of saying he died because of my sin and so now I'm going to stop living in sin. And until you're ready to say that, you don't know Jesus. Of course, he goes on to say this in verse two. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised, we too might be raised also. Anybody remember what Hebrews six says about this? What if you are you're drawn to the cross? You're mesmerized by the power of the only way you can be saved and you're baptized into Christ and you love him. But you decide to turn back to sin again, Hebrews 6. You decide that, look, I'm still drawn to you, but I'm going to go out and live how I want. What does the text say that we are doing if we choose to turn back to sin again? It says you crucify again the son of God, except this time you're holding the hammer. You're driving the nails. I'm convicted 
by the fact that he did that to free me from sin. And also, if I go live in sin again, I am crucifying him over and over again. In other words, putting him through the anguish of it all, except to no avail because of my life. Number two, there's a convicting power in his blood. If you're not convicted to live for righteousness, you need a better relationship with the sacrificed sin offering that is Christ. And then, of course, we've been mentioning it already. Go to 1 Corinthians 6 for this. So many great passages for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I could have used the word reconciling or redeeming or cleansing. What I wasn't going to use was atoning. I think I've made that point today. I wasn't going to say there's an atoning power in the blood. There's no cover here, no pitch, because there are no more cracks, no more seams, no more brokenness. We're sanctified. We're justified. We're whole and we're cleansed. 1 Corinthians 6 is so helpful, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The problem is that's all of us. We're all broken. He said, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God of our God. God hasn't covered you. He's repaired you. I would say something about this, that it is my experience in the church over my whole life in the church, but half of it preaching, that there are a great many Christians who walk around feeling a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of, I'm not good enough. Newsflash, you're not good enough. Let's get that out of the way. But this sense that because I'm not good enough, that I'm just, you know, God's never going to accept me and I'm broken. How many times you say, God, I'm broken. Yeah, you are. But listen, Jesus' blood has the purchasing power to get that vessel of yours, bring it back, and make it completely whole again. We should not be walking around with our heads hung low. There's no shame in Christ. Not because of our power, but because of his, because he sanctifies us. Let me show you 1 Peter 1 here. 1 Peter chapter 1. Love the opening of this. We studied it over and over again not too long ago. When we were in 1 Peter, we studied chapter 1 like three weeks in a row. But look in verse 2, he mentions to those who reside as aliens, 1 Peter 1, 2. And then here's what he says in verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. I've always wondered why it said sprinkled. You ever thought about that? Like, what does that mean, sprinkled? To me, it's a comparison. Hundreds of millions of gallons of animal blood was just pitch covering a crack. And yet just a singular drop of the blood of Jesus upon you would completely repair every sin and mistake of your life and make you whole with God again. Just the sprinkling of his blood on you, his sanctifying work. Now, what I really struggled with this week is what order to put these three points in. I kind of wrestled with it and I thought I would make it all like a sin like this and it didn't really work out. I've ordered it in terms of how someone becomes a Christian. This is the conversion order where first you say, hey, let me tell you about some hope. You've got no hope. Let me show you hope. Let me draw you to Christ, to the cross. Then I want you to see that you're going to have to repent of your sins, Acts 2. You got to be convicted like sin is this bad. I'm done with sin. And then you're baptized into Christ and you're sanctified. This is the uh, let's make Christians order. But it's not necessarily like the Chris Emerson order. To me, it's more like a circle. I don't know where I am day in and day out. Sometimes I feel like I've drawn close to the cross and yet sin is not a big deal. Sometimes I feel like sin is a big deal and yet I don't feel sanctified. Like I wrestle through all of these things. To the extent in your life that any one of these three things is missing, you will not be in a relationship with God. You need all three of them. The cross exists to draw you to it for your only hope, to draw you away from sin that caused it to begin with and to make you completely refreshed and new. And it's a circle and you're going to go through it your entire life. But understand this, as we get to this invitation portion, if there is anything missing in your life from this list, Jesus died to put it back. It needs to be there in you. And what it will build is a people who love Jesus more than life itself. And love him with every ounce of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let me give you one final thought here. I'll just mention this. It's from Leviticus. You know, I told you about Leviticus 16, which is the Day of Atonement. And you have a ram 
and you have a bull and they're taken in. And just the fact that Jesus represents those animals and he offered his life ought to be enough to make you desert sin or be baptized. But do you remember who remembers the scapegoat? The scapegoat. We don't talk enough about scapegoat. You guys know what a scapegoat is today. A scapegoat's the guy you dump all the stuff on. You let them take the fall. Well, did you know that the scapegoat comes from Leviticus 16 and the high priest's sin offering? That in fact, while he offered a bull and a ram, they actually brought two rams to him. They brought him two rams, the high priest on the Day of Atonement. One of the rams was sentenced to die. We already read about him. You lay that ram down, you slit that throat, you bleed it out, you put it everywhere, and it dies. It doesn't live on. It dies. But you needed that because that blood had power. The other ram, they put their hands on it. And figuratively, all of the sins of the nation fall upon the head of this living ram. And then you release it. And it carries the sins outside the camp, the scapegoat. It carries the sins outside the camp into the wilderness alive. Let me tell you about Jesus. He is the greatest fulfillment of everything God taught Israel. And he is both of those rams. Remember in John 10 when Jesus said, I will lay down my life for the sheep. That was awesome. But then he said in verse 16 and following, then I will take my life back up again. I will shed my blood so that your sins can be sanctified and cleansed from you. But I will also be the one who carries your sins outside of the camp. How can you be both dead and sacrificed and living and carrying? Only Jesus can do that. Because he died as one ram and now he lives as the scapegoat. Always alive, ready even right now to carry your sin outside the camp into the wilderness, if you will understand that he is your only way, if you are drawn to him, he died and he lives again. If you need that, look at the list. See what's missing. Make it right. For as long as we're here and he is our king and we have a chance to make choices, we can choose the cross. Is that your choice today? If you need to make it, the water's prepared. You can be baptized into Christ and sanctified. Whatever help you need, we're here for you as we stand together and sing.